second chapter of Acts is printed in the bulletin. I'm going to read a portion of what's printed in the bulletin, not the entire scripture that we originally uh, included. For the next few weeks, God willing, I'm going to be preaching on the sacraments, today baptism, and uh, next Sunday or two on the Lord's Supper. you understand why as we move forward, I hope. If you have your Bibles, let's attend to the reading of God's Word, remembering that this is God's Holy Word. He inspired it. This is what He wants us to hear. This is what He wants us to know. And growing out of that, what He wants us to do. I'm going to begin reading at verse 36 and read through the end of the chapter. I'll, I'll read through, I'm sorry, verse 49. Hear the word of the Lord. Let all the house of Israel know therefore, for it's certain that God has made him flesh, and Lord, and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, we bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this wicked generation. So those who received the word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. The implication is to the church. And the implication of the 3,000 not only including adults, but their children as well because of the promise. May God bless us as we look at this passage of Scripture. I've entitled the message, The Sign of the Covenant and our identity. Because we had an opportunity a few minutes ago to do something really wonderful. And I particularly want you parents and you young people and you future parents to listen very carefully to the message this morning. Because there are forces at work in our world today that are against you that are attempting to trip you up, causing you to stumble. We have an enemy who's always out to hurt us, to divide us, and to destroy the deepest relationships by encouraging us to turn away from family, by encouraging us to turn away from God, and by encouraging us to turn away from church. all under the guise of trying to convince us that it would be in our best interest to turn away from those things. If we're going to have our needs met in our life, we don't find it in church, in the family, or maybe even among some of the Christian friends that we've met along the way. One of the things that our North American culture does, I'm convinced, is to discourage us from growing up. At least from becoming mature in our thinking and our living. Let's assume for a moment that some of the experts are right when they say that the deepest needs in our lives, and particularly in the lives of young people, are the needs for identity and intimacy. Identity and intimacy. And let's assume for a moment that those are legitimate needs in our life. If that's true then, how and where we attempt to meet those needs becomes very critical. You know, 
know some of what I'm referring to this morning and saying that, I'm sure, the rise of gangs across the country. The increase in teen, teenage gangs. Groups getting together, identifying with whatever purpose they choose in their group. Now it's definitely true that God made us to be social beings. That's important. God did not create us to, in a sense, move into a convent when we were born or to move on a desert island. As a matter of fact, he says in his word that it's not good for people to be alone. There's an older pop song that I like very much because of what it says. People who need people are the luckiest people in the world. And I think that's true. But I believe the media, among other things, but especially the media, it has been guilty in recent years especially of giving out bad information about where those deep needs of identity and intimacy can be met. And consequently, we have a large number of youth that are destroying themselves emotionally, spiritually, physically, and socially because they are trying to get those needs in their life met in the wrong place and in the wrong way. And the sad thing about it is many of them are not even aware of doing that, at least at the outset. However, I must say that I think the media has actually stepped in and filled in a gap that often exists in the family and in the home and in the church. Many families today are more like war zones, more friction, more fighting, more tensions within the family than you might find in a war zone. Relations are strained. They're broken. They're damaged significantly among family members today. Our entire culture is attempting to distract us from really knowing how to meet the needs that we have in our life and to do so in a way that will not tear us down and destroy us. I think entertainment is one of those distractions because it encourages us to do whatever we choose to do to make us happy. Entertainment has a way of causing us to focus on ourselves. Friends, you know, focusing on ourselves is not the route to happiness. It doesn't work that way. But the sad thing is, that kind of thinking and encouragement to focus on ourselves is never, never the way to true happiness and satisfaction in life. And I think that's why so many young people today are trying to fill their lives with activities, and relationships, whether real or virtual, that can help meet those needs. But in reality, they can't. That's not what they're for. Because happiness goes much deeper than merely going to a rock concert or wearing a certain style of clothing or being with a certain group of people or an individual indiscriminately. On the surface, the approach of television oftentimes tries to create the impression that we can have an intimate, personal relationship with other viewers as a way of having those deep needs in our life met. 
Even if you're watching the televangelist on TV, I want you to be aware that even in the quiet and seclusion of your room or home, wherever you may be watching such a program if you do, I want you to watch how the producers go to such great lengths to convince us that we're watching this program with a million other people. And in doing that, we can actually experience relationship with the speaker and uh, with other personalities that may be involved in that form of electronic media. So now we are having virtual church when we watch the preacher on the screen. In our technological era, we are definitely trying to have our emotional and our intellectual needs met through the computer and through other forms of electronics. I just read an article this week in Wall Street Journal. The headline is Rising Addiction Among Teens with Smartphones. Very interesting article. Actually, it contrasts or compares the South Korean young people who may be at the top of the list technologically to the American teenagers. But here, here's what they say. Distracting students from their studies, experts say it's damaging their interpersonal the smartphones or damaging their interpersonal skills. Students today are very bad at reading facial expressions. When you spend more time texting people instead of talking to them, you don't learn how to read nonverbal language. So one of the teenagers said, I keep asking myself, why did I buy a smartphone? Sometimes I stay up all night using Facebook and tweeting. After switching to a smartphone, I quickly became addicted. In 2012, 37% of American teenagers had a smartphone, and they say that's increased probably 15% if the same survey was done today. Here's a comparison. The smartphone penetration rate in the U.S. is 50.4% as of June. <coughs> but you see what those things do, friends, is only create an illusion of intimacy, a fantasy, causes us to withdraw from family and friends and attempting to find our real needs met electronically. Now God put us together in such a way that we need certain and right intimacy and identity. But the truth is, hear this, the truth is we need to have those needs met first by healthy bonding within the family. Between parents and children, those needs are first of all to be met. And by God's grace, some children have grown up in homes where they did not experience that bonding and that intimacy and that sense of belonging. And they survived. But you and I both know there are a lot of adult children walking around in our world today who are hurt, wounded, mixed up because they never experienced real intimacy of bonding with their parents. So in God's scheme, that's where that experience should originate. And though the parent-child relationship is only temporary, because one day that child will grow up, leave mom and dad, marry his, his or her spouse, and they will create their own family unit. But until that day comes, I say this strongly to you, what day do you want to? God wants you to have your needs met within your family. And he placed those needs in your life and he created the environment where those needs can be met with mom or dad 
and brothers and sisters. It's not God's plan for us as we're growing up to try to meet needs in our life outside the family that he intended to be met, first of all, within the family. It's not God's primary way. Hence, any attempts that we make to try to meet those needs artificially or wrongly will sow seeds of destruction to those relationships. When I read the story of the prodigal son, Luke 15, I'm actually, it's the story of two prodigal sons. I, I have to imagine that when that young son said to his dad, I want all my belongings, I'm leaving, Satan must have had a great big grin on his face because that young son was breaking that bonding, bonding with his family and going off on his own, not in marriage, mind you. You know the rest of the story. After realizing that that didn't meet his needs, he came back home. He wasn't rejected. He was received by the father. And the father even threw a big celebration for him. And I can further imagine that Satan must have had a big frown on his face when that young son came home. During my years of ministry of Christian education and publications in our denomination, I spent a considerable amount of time studying, reading, speaking, teaching on the subject of the media and entertainment because the whole pop area uh, of our culture, which is an offshoot of modernity. If you remember last week, we talked about modernity being the love of the new and the novel and the pushing aside of the traditional. Encouraged by the culture to look to those artificial means of satisfying the needs of our lives. Now, if you don't believe what I'm saying this morning, I want you to go home after church. And I want you to count the number of televisions in your house. I want you to count the number of CDs and DVDs and any other electronic media that you might have there. And I'm not telling you they're wrong. I'm just asking you to take an inventory. Because those things have a way of crying out to us, folks, if you want to be cool, let us help you find meaning to your life. And if you were really be honest with yourself and you would add up all the hours and all the money that we spend on those things, I believe you would end up being in denial. And the sad thing is that counselors, psychologists, Ministers, educators, sociologists are telling us that loneliness among young people is the most critical need in their lives. Isolation is epidemic among the younger generation. I grieve when I hear of or read of teenager committing suicide or attempting to take his or her life. You've heard all of this, parents and young people. But hear this. We administered the covenant, a covenant baptism this morning to Emerson Van Tromp. So please hear me out and don't reject what I say too quickly. Think about it. Because everything I've been talking about up to this point, about the needs in our life, the need for intimacy, the need for bonding, the need for identity, all come together in this sacrament of baptism. Covenant baptism. Yes, it is true. We did something this morning that once believed and once understood can really meet the deepest needs in your life. You see, baptism is preparatory because it's a sign and a seal that says to us, we have identity. 
Actually, baptism is one of the main keys that God has given us to help us establish our identity. Because it symbolizes our belonging to God. A belonging to a family. And belonging to a Christian family. Please don't miss this. While baptism has significant biblical and theological meaning, it also has great significance psychologically and sociologically. Why? Because baptism reminds us of at least three things. First of all, we are not born in a vacuum alone. We come into this world bearing the image and likeness of God, the personal God of the Bible. We're not born into some kind of fatalistic, impersonal environment. In God, we live and move and have our being. Without Him, we're nothing. And even if we had been born hypothetically on a desert island with no one else around, we would not be alone because God is there. And upon meeting God's conditions, we could walk with Him and talk with Him on that island. You see, no matter where we go, God is there, as the psalmist says. But God never slumbers nor sleeps, so he watches over us. That's number one. The second thing that baptism reminds us of is that we are born into a family. Mother and father, brothers and sisters, maybe. Unlike all the rest of creation, the newborn baby is far more dependent on its family than any other part of God's creation. That's no accident. That's God's design. He places the solitary in families. And the family becomes that newborn's first contact and connection with the social world. The family by God's design, is to teach us how to live and function with other human beings. Intimacy, bonding, closeness, identity within the family meets the needs in our life that God has put there. And it's met by carrying out the role of a normal family setting. And when we fail to do that and look in the wrong places, as I said, we get ourselves into trouble. That's why the great truth in the saying, so goes the home, so goes the nation. A third thing that baptism reminds us of is that when the parents are Christian, newborn babies also come into a unique spiritual relationship with the covenant family of God, the church. The church is actually, the Bible says, and our standards remind us, is comprised of believers and their children. In the church, the Lord's body, we are members of one another. The Apostle Paul tells us in places like 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, that because we're members of his one body, the hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. No member can say to another member, I don't need you. The fact is, we need each other. And that's why you took a pledge this morning, along with Arnold and Emily, to be part of the rearing of that covenant child. So it's important that we understand and that we remember the significance of covenant baptism because it first reminds us of our relationship with the God who says, I will be your God and the God of your children. Second, it reminds us of the relationship that is to exist between parents and children in the home. And last, baptism establishes that relationship with the church of Jesus Christ. That's why, my friends, if we really understand what baptism is all about, it will bring us a real sense of belonging, a real sense of identity, of knowing who we are, 
and how to experience intimate relationships with one another. Because being a human being with personality and rationality and individuality, being creative and somewhat creative, is what life is all about. That's why I'm so sad today to see so much in our culture that's trying to change the makeup of the family, trying to redefine what a family is. For example, Ferdinand Longberg said, a family is near complete extinction. Psychoanalyst William Wolf says a family is dead, except maybe for the first year or two of child raising. How do you feel when you hear something like that? It really hurts my heart to hear statements like that. You look around you. Look at those statements in the context in which we live. What do we see? We see families losing their God-given role in our society. But not only do they lose their God-given role, in the process they sacrifice the identity as well. You see, we can't experiment and alter God's structure of a family and expect things to work very well. And it's no wonder that modern, both modern and postmodern men are characterized by loneliness and faith. John Don the Fourth, the, the uh, a poet, was right. He would say, No man is an island entire of himself. The feelings of isolation, the feelings of loneliness, with no open lines of communication with one another, is one of the most important problems facing our culture today. When we read some of the ads in the newspapers and listen to them on television, I want you to notice how much is geared to this idea of being lonely and how much is contributing to that. Even the U.S. Army changed its motto several years ago. We are an army of one. Hogwash. And we realize, as a result, why people, you know, especially young people, turn to drugs and sex. The wrong kind of friends. Dr. William Glasser, who is the founder of the Reality School of Psychology, in his book entitled Schools Without Failure, said that after much clinical observation, this loneliness and failure syndrome have so affected children that they no longer believe they have, they now believe they only have a very little chance to succeed and be happy. And he further said that we found in the children that we interviewed that among the children who failed to develop meaningful relationships with their family and beyond lack real self-conscious identity. And he said as a result, they're miserable, they're like a desert, and they're apathetic. Now, the sacrament of baptism reminds us that we do not have to fall into that trap of loneliness and failure orientation. While it's true that sin does alienate us from God, the sin does alienate us from others, and even alienates us from ourselves, and sin does cause us at times to believe that we're not any more than a useless passion, worth really nothing, no relationships, no identity, no more in communication. Baptism underscores the opposite. The opposite. We have identity. We are the covenant community of God. If you're a member of St. Paul's Church, I hope you have read, if you have not, I hope you will read a letter that was sent to the congregation of Wayne and Susan and Beverly Swanson that was speaking of their latest family crisis. What a precious letter that was and how it underscores the reality of what I'm talking about. You see, Jesus Christ is the key to who we really are. And baptism, properly understood, 
visibly symbolizes that relationship, the reality that we have identity and we really belong. It signifies that God in Christ died for our sins and was raised for our justification. And that we can enter into a personal relationship with God and his people. God is here. God is real. The church is here. And the church is real. God in Christ has a unique way of bringing people together, not only with him, but with one another within the family. And baptism is intended to visibly communicate that relationship to us. Think about this. Think about Jesus. Jesus understood loneliness. Jesus understood isolation. No other human being on this earth was ever alone while Jesus was alone. And he experienced that aloneness for us. You remember crying out on the cross, my God, my God, why have, have you forsaken me? By his ignominious death, he has redeemed us. And he's given us that hope of victory and forgiveness. And because he died for you and me, he dealt with anything that would keep us from experiencing that real and personal relationship with him. You see, Christianity is a religion of the truth. And in that context of the truth, we have to understand that Christianity is a relational religion. Relationships and identity. That's what Christianity is really all about. If we lived in the Old Testament era of the church, this morning, instead of baptizing the innocent, he would have been circumcised because that's what God instructed Abraham to do with his newborns, to circumcise the male child on the eighth day to identify him with the people of God. But in the New Testament side of the church, there are no more bloody sacrifices because Jesus shed his blood on the cross. There is no need for any more shed blood. Jesus is enough. So in our catechism, which lays out our doctrinal understanding of Scripture, there are two questions that are asked and answered. First, what is baptism? The answer it is a sacrament or an ordinance instituted by Christ himself, wherein by the washing of water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, signifies and seals our engrafting into Christ a partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace and our engagement to be the Lord's. Then it asks, who is to be baptized? The answer is members of the visible church and their children. When my oldest son his family that uh, they worshiped with us last week. When they lost their five-month-old son as a result of a viral heart infection, one of the things that comforted them and all of us at that time was the fact that little Jake, the fact that I had the privilege of baptizing him when he was six weeks old, we were reminded through his sickness at Edison Hospital and through his death that Jake belonged to the Lord. His God's sign was upon him. So there it baptism. God, his people, being belonging, being grafted into Christ, and a partaker of the privileges of being in the visible church. All of that symbolizes our engagement to be the Lord. I like what the Jake what J.I. Packer uses by way of analogy when he talks about taking baptism seriously. He said, speaking of baptism, whether it's an adult baptism or the baptism of children, he said, being baptized, having that water applied to us as we did to Emerson this morning, is like putting on a uniform. 
putting on a uniform in order to serve God, uh, to serve his country like a service man does. And he says that wearing that uniform means that we must take God seriously. Take God seriously. Now, baptism, understand, is not salvation, as some believe. Christ is the Savior, but baptism is that sign and seal that communicates all the truth of salvation to us and to our children. Baptism publicly proclaims that God is my God and the God of my children. So I was born in America. My children were born in America. They didn't have any choice about that. That's where we were. But as they've grown, now they have self-consciously proud even with all the problems that are going on in America to tell you that they are Americans. That's the way it's supposed to work. So I say to you this morning, on the basis of God's promise to be our God and the God of our children, if you have been baptized this morning, like we baptized Emerson, listen, you will never, you will never, you will never, no, never be alone again. Christ meets our needs of forgiveness and the need to be loved. Christ is the key to meeting those deep needs in our lives. And what else can I say this morning? But children, if you have believing parents, thank God for them every day. Listen to them. Follow their advice and instruction. And parents, I would say to you, if you have children, teach them from their earliest to find their meaning and their hope in life in Jesus Christ. And to the rest of us, let's rejoice that we are Christ and members of his body. Now, without being too specific at this point, I want to tell you something. I saw a real demonstration of this belonging and identity this past week. As I saw members of this church come together, come alongside a family that had great need in order to be with them, and to support them, and to comfort them. What a blessing it was to me as a newcomer to St. Paul's to see the church being the church that God intends for us to be. You see, life builds us many painful situations which maybe we cannot face alone by ourselves. And that's why we need to practice our identity with the Lord as a good people. That's why we need to bear one another's burdens and to love one another as God has commanded us. And we need to thank God every day for himself. But we also need to thank God every day for each other in the family. You see, fellowship, relationships are a precious, a precious possession in today's hostile, lonely, and hurting world. My friends, don't trade those off for that which only gives the illusion of satisfaction. So in conclusion, as we come to prepare to come to the Lord's table, I want to ask you this morning, very seriously, very earnestly, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that baptism symbolizes that I've been talking about? Have you believed in Jesus? And have you committed your life to him and repented of your sins? If so, are you working within the body of Christ to minister to one another on his behalf? To come alongside and be aware of the possibilities of helping someone who may be trapped in that failure, loneliness, identity, or lack of identity syndrome? Are you willing 
to commit yourself to God in such a way that will show your love for Him by loving one another. You see, our prayer and our desire is that St. Paul's Church will be a beacon of light, of hope, along the coast of a dark, lonely, hostile, alienated, hurting world. Where the walls of separation are torn down, where we can know God and each other in a way that supports us and encourages us to walk in Christ every day of our lives. I hope you're there. If not, we would be pleased to talk to you about your relationship with the Lord. There's nothing more important than knowing that God loves us. Our Father in heaven, this morning, we need you in our lives so very much. But we thank you that you are the answer to our life's needs. Not only for forgiveness, but also to help us build the right kind of patterns of living, relationships, and all. Don't let Satan blind our minds that will hurt and destroy our lives. But Lord, speak to us and draw us to yourself. And help us to love you. Because you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.